Good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. Our author is here, and we're very excited about that. Um, tonight, we are pleased to present Rich Lowry, who's here to introduce his latest book, Lincoln Unbound, How an Ambitious Young Rail Splitter Saved the American Dream and How We Can Do It Again. And Rich's appearance is co-sponsored by Elm Street Books, who's also here tonight with us. So thank you, Elm Street, for coming. Uh, in this book, which is a persuasive blend of politics and history, Rich argues a return to the dynamic, upwardly mobile political and economic climate that Lincoln promoted and exemplified. As a founding father and ambitious individual, Abraham Lincoln is revered across the political spectrum. In Lincoln Unbound, National Review editor Rich Lowry takes an illuminating look at Lincoln, tracing his ascendancy from rail splitter to political powerhouse and illustrating how Lincoln embodied the American dream. Lowry argues that Lincoln's personal creed of hard work and individual advancement and his political beliefs of limited government interference and open economic opportunity are as relevant to political conservatives today as they were then. Lowry also illustrates how America's success as a nation depends upon a return to Lincoln's convictions and principles. Rich Lowry was named editor of National Review in 1997. He's a syndicated columnist and commentator for the Fox News Channel. He writes for Politico and Time Magazine and often appears on public affairs programs such as Meet the Press and Face the Nation. His previous book, Legacy, Paying the Price for the Clinton Years, was a New York Times bestseller. Please join me in welcoming Rich Lowry to New Canaan Library. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you to the library and uh, to Elm Street Books for being here as well. I have a connection to New Canaan. My wife is from New Canaan, and my in-laws still live here. Uh, my in-laws are here tonight, so I'm going to refrain from any in-law jokes. Um, but actually, in fairness, in-law humor works both ways. Um, during World War II, in one moment when Churchill was feeling particularly depressed, his wife told him, well, Winston, just cheer up. You know, think you could be in a Mussolini's position right now. And his, he said, don't tell me that Mussolini got to shoot his son-in-law. Um, <laughs> so I've written this book on, on Lincoln. If you'll indulge me, I'll just give you a brief glimpse into the life of a, a new author. You know, when you come out with a, a book, you are just obsessed with your book. And uh, on part of the promotional tour, I was flying out to California, and I had my iPad, and the plane had Wi-Fi service, so I was obsessively checking my email, and I, I get this uh, panicked one-line email from my wife that said, did you buy $500 worth with our credit card at Walmart? And I was obsessed with my book, so I immediately thought she was accusing me of using our own credit card to buy my own book at Walmart. And I, I thought at the time, okay, you know, I'm a desperate author, but I'm not quite that desperate. And what was uh, particularly interesting personally for me, for me about this is it turned out to be a fraudulent charge. Someone had uh, taken our credit card and put this charge on it, and he hadn't even bought books, which if he had, I guess would have been the perfect crime, uh, but he didn't. But I never would have noticed this fraudulent charge on our bill. And my wife, Vanessa, noticed it instantly because she monitors our credit card bill in real time. A couple months ago, I was out of touch for a while and I came home and she said, I hadn't heard from you, but I wasn't worried because I realized you were at the bar watching the hockey game. So every single beer as it was ringing up, she must have been watching on her screen. So I know some of you are worried about the NSA creating a 24-hour surveillance state in this country. I've been married for two years. Believe me, you get used to it. It's not that bad. So let me, I'm going to just talk uh, about my book for about 15 minutes or so, give you a summary of the argument, and then I'm happy to bat around any questions you have about uh, the book, about Lincoln, about contemporary politics, whatever you want to uh, discuss. So I focus on an aspect of Lincoln that I think is relatively neglected, but is absolutely central to him, and I, I think the most important thing about him, and I focus on him as an advocate of and an exemplar of aspiration. 
And Lincoln is pretty much revered now by everyone and across the political spectrum, with some exceptions. But I still think even now he's kind of underestimated in the common understanding. People tend to think of him as a tribune of common sense, as uh, just a common guy who happened to be an accidental president. And none of that is true. This was someone who was fiercely ambitious right from the beginning. This is someone who had an exceptional mind and an amazing memory uh, that people remarked on right from the beginning. When he was a kid, he had an interest in politics very early and would borrow newspapers, and when he would give them back, people recalled later that he'd be able to recite the editorials, almost line by line, that appeared in the newspapers. And he also had a really uncanny sense of how humans work and what human nature is and what makes the world go. He, um, he liked to tell a story about how you can't really influence people's behavior reliably with a promise of a far-off benefit or with a threat of a, a far-off punishment. And he illustrated this point with a story about an Irishman who steals a spade. And he's very pleased with himself because he gets away with this act of theft. And someone uh, comes up to him and says in the politically incorrect argo of the day, well, Patty, you know, you think you've gotten away with stealing that spade, but let me tell you, when you die and when you go and you meet your maker, you're going to have to pay for that spade. And the Irishman says, well, in that case, if you're going to credit me that long, I think I'll take another. Um, <laughs> and, and Lincoln understood how the world worked because he'd really experienced uh, a life of hard knocks. But when he was in the White House, he, he loved the theater. He loved Shakespeare. We, as we know, you know fatally, he, he was at the theater uh, when he was assassinated. But he, he saw a play, and he was quite taken with it. And he wrote a letter to one of the actors. And the actors, actor immediately realizes great public relations potential for him. He leaks the letter to the newspaper. It's published in the newspaper. And Lincoln is mocked all around the country. You know, who, who's this guy who can barely be the commander in chief? Now he's our theater critic in chief. You know, what, what is he thinking? And um, the actor then realized what a mistake he had made and how he embarrassed uh, Lincoln for no good reason and wrote an abject apology to Lincoln. And Lincoln wrote him back um, a note that said, you know what, in my life I've experienced a lot of ridicule without much malice and a lot of kindness not entirely free of ridicule. I am used to it. And every time I, I say those lines, I find them a little heart-rending. But th this is a guy who um, ha had been beaten up uh, by life. And to understand him, you need to go back to the very beginning, where he's raised literally in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky and then in Indiana. In the area where his family lived in Indiana, another family there who also lived in a log cabin reported that at night, when they had the fire going in the cabin, they would see the eyes of bears shining into their cabin through the chinks in the, in the logs. There's a story about a, a young girl who in this area got killed by a panther because her brother wasn't able to kill the panther quickly enough with a hatchet to the skull. Okay, so this is a very unforgiving environment. This is not suburban bliss. This is not New Canaan. It's not even Stamford. Um, <laughs> Lincoln's um, stepmother and her aunt and uncle died when he was very young, altogether something called milk sick. A cow would wander out into the forest. It would eat a poison root. There was no way to know it had eaten a poison root. It would come back, and its milk would be poisoned. You would drink it, and you'd be dead, and a horrifying death within a week. Within a week. So Lincoln has to fashion a wooden coffin, bury his, his mom with his dad out in the backyard. No funeral sermon because there's no minister in the vicinity until uh, months later. He said of this area, there was absolutely nothing to excite an ambition for education. His mother signed her name with an X. His stepmother, who adored him and was a great blessing uh, in his childhood, signed her name with an X. His father, uh, he once said, could bunglingly sign his name. He told this to a campaign biographer in 1860, and the biographer thought it was so harsh, such a harsh way to put it, he left it out of the uh, biography. But Lincoln, to illustrate kind of the pedagogical uh, technique and atmosphere of this time, told a story in the White House about a one-room uh, schoolhouse 
and they're reading the, the Bible as it was legal to do uh, at that time. And the, uh, the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar and this one poor kid couldn't get the names of the three children in the story right, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So boom, teacher you know, slaps, him up, uh, 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 slaps him on the head and he breaks down in tears, no one bats an eye, and the lesson keeps on going, and all, all the kids are reading lines of the, of the chapter, and it's coming back around, and the kid starts to whimper again, because, he, because he's counting up how many lines are left, and is coming, uh, he knows what's coming back to him, and the teacher says, you know, son, na now what's wrong? And, he, and the kid says, uh, master, here come those three damn fellows again, and boom, I'm sure he was, he was uh, hit up against, against the, the head again, and this is really the key thing to understand about Lincoln. We refer to him as the rail splitter. We know him as the rail splitter president. I use, use that um, phrase in, in my um, subtitle because it really was a great act of myth making when he was, um, became the favorite son of the Illinois Republican Party for president in 1860. They bring out these rails he had split and dub him the rail splitter. But Lincoln never wanted to split another damn rail in his life. With every fiber of his being, he wanted to escape this backwoods environment and create an America where no one had to live that way ever again. And if there's one key story that illustrates this aspect of Lincoln, again, it's a story he told in the White House. And he said he was a uh, young teenager, and he had a rowboat in the side of the Ohio River. And it was a, a part of the river where there wasn't a wharf. And these two guys drive up in a carriage with their luggage, and they want to meet a steamboat coming down the river. There's no way to get to it unless someone rows them out. So they see Lincoln. They say, hey, kid, will you row us out to the steamboat? And Lincoln is happy to do it. He rows them out. He helps them with their luggage. They're on the steamboat. They're about to leave. And Lincoln says, hey, you forgot to pay me. And he said in the White House decades later, that each of them threw a silver half dollar down on the bottom of his boat, and he realized at that moment that he had earned his first dollar, and he said he was a more hopeful and optimistic being from that time. Lincoln wanted an America where you could earn dollars and where you had to earn dollars, and in a nutshell, that's why he wasn't a Democrat. Um, he, he was surrounded by Democrats, um, in, the, in the backwoods area where he, where he lived, everyone worshipped Andrew Jackson, you know, this great bloody-minded general, this great Mars of the backwoods. If you want to understand what uh, Andrew Jackson was like, think of the, the late Pennsylvania Republican Senator um, Arlen Specter, who was kind of a mean son of a bitch, except for he might kill you, okay? That was Andrew Jackson. And Jackson, uh, the Jacksonian Democrats and the Jeffersonian Democrats before him worshipped this backwoods way of life. They thought the yeoman farmer, the subsistence farmer, was uniquely virtuous and the backbone of the country that had to be pres preserved. And they distrusted finance. They distrusted industry. And Lincoln had, um, had no use for this kind of romanticism about the agricultural life because he had had that life uh, up to the neck himself and wanted to turn his back on it. So he doesn't become a Democrat. He turns his back on the Democrats. He becomes a Whig. And he's attracted to the basic Whig economic program, which in a nutshell is we're not going to have a barter or subsistence economy. Uh, we're going to have cash. Okay? If you can have cash, you have to have banks. Um, we're going to have industry in this country. And if we're not going to be an agricultural country forevermore and have industry, well, you need to encourage industry. So we're going to have a tariff. And finally, we want to have a market economy. And if you want to have a market economy, the country actually has to be connected together. And this is why Lincoln loves steamboats. He loves canals. He loves railroads. These are absolutely transformative technologies. Because if, if you're a farmer in an area where Lincoln grew up, there was one way to move your goods, and that was by river. And if you're lucky enough to rib, live by a river, you could build a raft, you could float it down the Mississippi, you could get it to New Orleans, and once it's uh, in New Orleans, it can go anywhere, because now you're on the ocean and you can um, transport goods the way they've been transported for centuries and centuries, quite, efficient, quite efficiently. But before the era of the steamboat, there's no way for, good way for you to get back up 
the Mississippi. Some people would walk. There's a story that Lincoln's father made this trip twice and walked all the way home. That is not the predicate of a functioning market economy. And what happens in these areas, once a railroad touches them or a canal touches them, everything changes. Because now you can buy goods from the east. You can buy manufactured goods. You can buy clothing. How are you going to get them? You need cash. How are you going to get cash? Well, you're no longer going to grow food just for yourself. You're going to grow it to sell it. And instantly, people who are subsistence farmers become market players. And they might not even grow their own food anymore because that's not the most efficient crop. Um, and that's not the most efficient use of their land. So they grow for the market. So this is why Lincoln is such an enthusiast uh, for canals and railroads. So that's one part of the Whig program. Another was a cultural element, which was very attractive to Lincoln. And the Whigs had the insight that it wasn't enough just to create a market. You had to create people who would live orderly, orderly lives and self-disciplined lives so they could take advantage of that market. And Lincoln evangelized uh, for this ethic and represented it his um, entire life. When his stepbrother, who was left back in the backwoods, was hard up for cash all the time and would write Lincoln letters asking him to borrow money, Lincoln would write back um, letters that I'm sure were well-meaning but were quite excoriating, saying, you are destitute because you idle away all your time. Go to work is the only cure for your case. Young lawyers would write to Lincoln when he became a lawyer, how do I become a lawyer? And Lincoln would write back things like work, work, work. And um, Lincoln exemplified uh, this himself at a time when America was soaked in alcohol, soaked in tobacco, and when coarse language was the norm, Lincoln didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he didn't swear, although he told the occasional off-color story. Uh, he liked to tell a story on himself about um, sharing a railway car with a gentleman from Kentucky. And the gentleman from Kentucky offers him a glass of fine whiskey. Lincoln's no thanks. Offers him a fine cigar. Lincoln's no thanks. Offers him a plug of tobacco. Lincoln's no thanks. Finally, the frustrated Kentuckian says, well, sir, can I share with you an insight uh, from my long travels in this world? And Lincoln, sure, what is it? And the Kentucky gentleman says, he who has damn few vices has damn few virtues. But in, in this sense, Lincoln had damn few vices. It was a time of casual cruelty to animals. And Lincoln was embarrassingly tenderhearted towards animals. There's a story about how when he was a lawyer, he would ride the circuit with other lawyers and with judges. They'd go from courthouse to courthouse on, on their horses, a very kind of rough uh, male environment. And one day when they were out, uh, in their travels, Lincoln disappeared, and uh, they all stopped looking for him. And they asked the guy who came up uh, from uh, the rear, who had been back with Lincoln, you know, what happened to him? You know, where did he go? And he said, well, the last time I saw him, he was chasing around a bird's nest that had fallen out of a tree. And when Lincoln finally gets uh, back up with all these guys, they're making fun of him, razzing him. Lincoln, you know, what, what, what kind of fool are you? <laughs> You're wasting our time. And he said, no, no, look, if I had not returned those baby birds to the mother, I would not have been able to sleep tonight. Um, he, there was a, a cat in the White House, and there's a story from a, a visitor who went there uh, for dinner that the, the cat was sitting during this dinner on a chair next to Lincoln, and Lincoln was feeding the cat with the official White House flatware. And as you might imagine, as, and as I now understand as a married man, this outraged Mary Todd, you know, and she tells the, the visitor, don't you think it's crazy that the President of the United States is feeding the cat with the official flatware? And Lincoln said, no, no, look, if this gold fork was good enough for Buchanan, it's good enough for Tabby. <laughs> so what, what does Lincoln do with this, this ethic of self-discipline, uh, this kind of countercultural um, ethic of self-improvement. Well, he makes himself into a lawyer. And some of us tend today to view lawyers as parasitic bottom feeders, present, any, anyone in the present company accepted. But lawyers then were really the um, setting down the rules of this new capitalist order that was rising in America, bankruptcy law and right of way for railroads and all the rest of it. And Lincoln initially wasn't much of a lawyer. Um, there's a story from one of his former clerks that apparently congressmen, and Lincoln was a congressman, of course, for one term, they would go around and spread seeds to farmers kind of as a, um, as, as a gift and to give them the latest seeds, sort of the latest technology. And apparently Lincoln 
uh, when he was carrying these seeds as a congressman and visited his own law office, he dropped some of them. And the clerk said there was actually enough dirt in one of the corners that a plant had sprung up in the corner of the office. But um, eventually, Lincoln becomes quite a big deal as a lawyer in Illinois. And in fact, he be became the biggest corporate lawyer in the state of Illinois, which does not necessarily accord with the common image of Lincoln. Lincoln um, had no problem with it whatsoever. And this, again, goes to his basic economic attitudes. Lincoln worshiped property rights. He worshiped the rule of law. He thought in a properly functioning economy, there should be no such thing as class conflict. He opposed redist uh, redistributionist economics. In the White House, uh, there was a delegation of working men who visited him during the war, and he said, let not him who is houseless pull down the house of another, but labor diligently to build one of, its, one of his own. And undergirding all this for Lincoln was a profound belief in the dignity of labor and people's right to the proceeds of their own labor. He quoted a line from Genesis repeatedly, thou shalt earn thy bread through the sweat of thy brow. Or as he put it more informally, he who makes the corn should eat the corn. And for Lincoln, anything that fundamentally violated this principle was really an act of theft. His father, when, um, when Lincoln was a young man and a big, strong guy, would hire him out to the neighbors to work in the fields and slaughter uh, pigs and all sorts of nasty work and would, would take uh, the money that Lincoln earned, as was his father's right until Lincoln reached age 21. And Lincoln resented this greatly. And in a speech years later, he said, in a self-pitying exaggeration, but it gives you an idea of where he was coming from on this, he said, I used to be a slave because I worked and someone else um, took the fruit of my work. And of course, this gets to his opposition to real slavery. There's that wonderful line in the second inaugural where he refers to slavery as unrequited toil. It's making other people work and it's taking what they earn. And Lincoln thought in a little fragment he wrote for himself, he, he, in preparing for uh, speeches and debates, he'd write out his, his arguments and the logic of him. So there are all these little fragments that were never uh, published anywhere or they never, he, that he never used directly. And in one of them, he writes about how even the ant understands this principle. You know, the lowest, most crawling insect on earth. If that ant finds a crumb, and if that ant works to drag that crumb to its nest, and you interrupt that ant, and you try to take the crumb from the ant, the ant will fight you because the ant understands through its labor that crumb now belongs to it. And Lincoln thought there was no misunderstanding this principle. It was so basic unless it was done willfully and out of self-interest. And he thought that uh, was what was happening in the South. And if you read Lincoln's speeches and writings in the 1850s, they're suffused with this profound sense of loss because he believed correctly the founders had tolerated slavery because they thought there was no easy way to get rid of it, but they were embarrassed by it. The word slavery does not appear in the Constitution because eventually uh, they hoped and wanted it to go away. And instead, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s in the South, you had kind of a new attitude rising among the fire eaters, which was a much more positive and affirmative defense of slavery, where these writers and politicians would say slavery is a positive good it's an institution from God, it's good for the slaves, it's good for the owners, it's good for all of society. And for Lincoln, this just represented shameful national backsliding. He would say things like, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it and wash it white in the blood, if not the spirit, of the American Revolution. And this was Lincoln's fundamental project. It was forging progress in the country. It was enhancing opportunity, but doing it through a return to our founding ideals. You know, American culture at any time and place celebrates what, what is new, but Lincoln was unabashed in talking about what was old, our ancient faith in the Declaration of Independence, those old time men, those iron men, our old fathers. He wanted to return to their ideals and forge a new awakening in America through them. And I think this kind of sense of loss is um, kind of a, a productive and constructive sense of loss 
is important for us today because uh, I think we really have a crisis of opportunity in this country. And it's not so much income inequality, which we hear so much from, um, from the left, about from the left, it's a crisis of mobility. And the question before us is, are we going to remain a country where people like Lincoln, born with nothing, can make the most of themselves and still get ahead? And if that's not true, we may still be a powerful country for a very long time. We may be a rich country for a very long time, but we won't necessarily be a good country, and we won't be America as we have always known it. And conservatives especially like to pride ourselves on this country's mobility. But that image is a little bit out of date. There are Western European countries, there are other English-speaking countries that are more mobile uh, than we are. And I think that should be a national uh, scandal and a concern um, that all of us should be seized with. And I'll just leave you with one last quote um, from Lincoln before I close. Long before anyone had heard of him, when he was a young man, he gave what's called the Lyceum Address in Springfield, Illinois, and there's a wonderful passage in there that I think is particularly apt for today, where he talks about how even then, when this is a very immature uh, country, that it was invulnerable to military assault. He said you could take all the armies in the world, you could put the greatest general in world history, Napoleon, at the head of that army, and that army could not set foot on the Blue Ridge Mountains or take a drink in the Ohio River by force of arms. Then he goes on to say, if destruction be our lot, our lot, we ourselves must be its author and its finisher. And as a nation of free, free men, we either must live through all time or die by suicide. And I think it's very important that we resolve to live. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, an open-ended question. Will Lincoln to return to the United States in 2013, would you recognize it? If Lincoln were to return to the United States now, would he recognize it? Yes, I think so. Because um, I, th I think America, broadly as it exists, um, is the America he wanted to create, and in some ways bequeathed to us. You know, the financial centers, um, the industry, the technology, the gadgets. Lincoln loved um, technologies and gadgets. They would tell the story, um, they would say of him that when he was out traveling the circuit, whenever he would see something, a new agricultural implement, he would stop and marvel at it and study it and understand how it worked. And this is one reason he was such a great patent lawyer, is he could understand the mechanics, he had a very logical mind, but then also he had the ability to explain it in a plain spoken way. So he loved Steve Jobs, he would have been all over Steve Jobs, he'd be, you know, he'd have the latest iPhone what, version, whatever it is. What I, I would argue, and this is impossible to prove, what runs counter to, what he would be shocked by and runs counter to his spirit is so much of the welfare state, which, which I think, you know, at least at the margins, undermines the work ethic that was so important to him and the ethic of individual responsibility and striving. Now, again, I, I can't prove that. It's 150 years ago. You know, he, his views would have, uh, you know, could very well have changed on things. But you, you can't look at what he said and believed then and think he would have been entirely comfortable with where the country has gone uh, in, in that way now. Thank you. Open-ended questions are the best kind. They're very, very welcome. <laughs> what you brought up just now about the sure. welfare state and, and you know, basically too late for whatever other reason the government promises to take care of them and cradle the grave. Don't you think, or do you think that it's too late now to kind of reverse it? People just need to and want to expect things to understand <coughs> now so that if you try yeah. to turn it around, it's better for them. Yeah, is it, is it, is it too late? Um, well, if it is, I'll never admit it. You know, because I'm here to fight that. And you, you, can't, you can't fight it if you've, you know, already uh, given up. And there are a couple things that, that give me um, encouragement. One, part of the, you know, the growth of food stamps and disability benefits, part of it is just a reaction to a rotten economy. And I don't think a rotten economy in this country is inevitable. Um, and there are better policies that we can pursue. Um, you know, Clinton, near the end of his term, said he, one of his great insights was actually the best jobs program 
um, the best anti-poverty program is actually creating jobs in the country. So if we had a president who was really committed to that and understood how the economy worked, I think we'd see improvement in that area. And then although we've seen um, a breakdown in what I, I call in the book kind of basic bourgeois virtues, um, you know, that's disturbing. And it's especially true um, in the working class, you know, non-college educated people, and especially true among men. Um, you know, they tend not to, working class men, they tend not to be married so much anymore. They don't go to church, they're not civically involved, and they're more loosely attached to the workforce than they, than they are ever before. So some re researchers have asked, well, what are they doing? Right? Well, it turns out they're sleeping and they're playing video games. Okay? I mean, this is a social, unspooling social disaster. So that, it's no doubt there's a disturbing trend. But even the, the Democrats, you know, you look at their convention last time around. Do they, they, they celebrate not working and, you know, taking government benefits? No, they don't. You know, like Michelle Obama told a very moving story about her father and her address at the Democratic convention. And it was about how he was, you know, nearly crippled but would struggle up and down the stairs every day to, to go to work. And that is still the story that kind of touches the heart, I think, of, of most Americans. And um, for me, that, that means that that sentiment is, is still there and still there to be tapped. But we need to get the economy going. And two, we need people standing up uh, for these for these uh, virtues and trying to forge kind of a cultural renewal around them, which is something that government at the margins can help uh, with, but at the end of the day, depends on churches and civic institutions and a cultural renewal forged by the culture itself. I don't think you're any more optimistic at the end of the answer, but that's the best I got for you. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, what would he would think of the nuclear option? You know, Lincoln was a partisan, and th this is something that's been forgotten a little bit in the glorious haze around him. In the way he was able to rise above partisanship, you know, during during the war. But for most of his career, he was a fierce uh, partisan. The Whigs hated dueling. But Lincoln almost got in a duel because he would write these anonymous newspaper articles just viciously lampooning his political enemies. And he wrote one about the state auditor of Illinois um, and the, a guy named James Shield, quite a hothead, who was very offended and went to the newspaper editor and said, who wrote this? And the editor felt honor bound to say, oh, it was uh, Abraham Lincoln. And, um, and then Shields challenged Lincoln to a duel. And at that time and that place, if you turn that down, your political career is over, basically. So Lincoln accepted. And as a challenged party, he got to choose the weapons. And he chose cavalry broadswords, which doesn't seem to make any sense until you realize that, that um, Lincoln was 6'4", and Shields was like 5'8". And everyone remarked on how Lincoln, incredibly long Lincoln's arms were, even for a 6'4", uh, man who was 6'4". Eventually, the, the duel, the dispute was adjudicated, and he, and he didn't fight. But he was not um, beyond partisan maneuvers. So on, on that one, I kind of think it, it depends on where he, um, which side of the aisle he would have been uh, sitting on. And of course, it would have been the Republican one, so he would have been outraged by it. <laughs> I don't think, by the way, seriously on that, I don't think the um, filibustering judges, it's not a very important thing to need to do. Because no one had done it, done it before, before Democrats started doing it in 03, 04, 05. So that doesn't particularly bother me. But for me, it's, it does speak to a certain um, distaste for rules and procedure if they stand in the way of their goals, which we, we see um, among Democrats. Yeah, now and there is no way as a matter of principle you'd say, oh, we have to eliminate filibuster for all judges except for Supreme Court justices. That makes no sense. And that's entirely because Democrats want to preserve the option to, to filibuster Supreme Court justices when they don't like them. And of course, this is an invitation when Republicans take control of the Senate, which they will someday eventually, and perhaps even after 2014. Um, to change the rules in their favor as well. And it, and it creates the uh, temptation for Republicans if they get the Senate and if they win the presidency and have unified control of, of government in 2017 
to even further erode the protections of the minority in the Senate and do all they can to kind of jam through a conservative agenda uh, in that one year window you kind of have for, for big changes the same way the Democrats did in, in 09. So I just think it's for Democrats, and this may be what they call concern trolling when you're on the other side and saying how you're worried about the consequences of what they've done, how it's gonna hurt them, but it does seem to me as something that's gonna uh, potentially come back and bite them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, let me just briefly, a little on the Gettysburg Address. There are some myths that you know he wrote it on the train up on the back of an envelope. He would never, ever do that with any important remarks. He, he drafted and redrafted and revised. He hated giving impromptu remarks when he, um, when so-called serenaders after victories in the war or after political victories for him would you know, come to his window and ask for a speech, he wouldn't give it to them. And he, he actually, he was very sensitive to audience reaction as well. So he wouldn't wanna mess anything up. He said no one was more sensitive to how an audience uh, reacted to a speaker than he, he was. So he, so he worked on that thing and it reflects um, you know, a couple things obviously. One is just his um, great ear for the musicality of words. And this, this is someone who's steeped in the Bible, even though he wasn't a um, conventionally religious man, who reads Shakespeare. And if you want an education as a rhetorician, those are the two places to go. Plus, he's an amateur poet. And very often, failed or amateur poets are wonderful pro stylists, as he was. And then finally, you know, just the commitment to the ideals and the understanding of the country. And um, he, he had the ability to kind of think things through to the bottom in the way other people didn't. So you great, get this you know, 270 words or whatever it is that's just like this logical machine and says it all so briefly. You don't, you don't do that unless you have a very powerful mind. And then on the very important point you hit on, the modesty, there's an example I have in my book I, I use as a jumping off point, this little speech he gave to this Ohio regiment in the White House. And they come in and he says, I like to talk to soldiers about the, what the war is about. And he basically said it's about opportunity. Um, and he said, any of you, your sons may one day occupy this big white house the way my father's child has. Now why would anyone refer to himself as my father's child except for if it's to avoid saying I or me and appearing boastful? So he, he had a, um, a great trust in his own capacities and an understanding of them. Um, and I think realized a certain level he was superior to other men, but then there was this, this modesty that kept that understanding from running out of control. And then writ large is why you get the second inaugural address where he's winning a war. He's winning a war for national survival. And it's not about him and what he's done. It's not even really about what his side has done. It's about the national sins and a, a much broader and deeper understanding of them. And really the most profoundly religious state document in American history by this man who, who wasn't a, a conventional Christian. So I think that you, you hit on something really, really Im, important and deep. So the standards are very high for your question, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. healing process between the North and the South that he could carry forward as part of his legacy? Yes, that's, that's also an excellent question, an unanswerable question at the end of the day. He had a very um, generous attitude towards Reconstruction um, towards the end, and one that was at odds with the radical Republicans in Congress. 
but I think at the end of the day, he probably would have ended up where all they ended up if he had seen the continued racist depredations in the South and the way the South initially just sends Confederates uh, back to, Confederate leaders back to Congress. And the interplay with Lincoln and Congress is, is very fraught and is very interesting throughout his time in office because Lincoln was really the first rhino, the first Republican in name only, because the radical wing of his party in Congress hated him for being overly cautious and for delaying, you know, initially in the war when Union generals would take slave territory and free the slaves and pronounce local emancipations, Lincoln would draw it back because he thought it was too soon and you're going to kick away the support of the border states and then the whole war will be lost and then you've gained nothing. So let's wait, let's be prudent. Um, and and uh, the radical Republicans hated him for that and Lincoln referred to the radical Republicans as fiends facing Zionwards which means they're devils to deal with, but he knew ultimately they were heading in the, the same direction. And you look at, at everything important that happened, the, the, the guys in Congress kind of led the way and were a couple steps ahead of Lincoln, but Lincoln would always catch up. And that's why I think um, that the myth that, I, I believe it's a myth that Lincoln wouldn't have ended up you know, favoring kind of a, a military reconstruction of the sort his party uh, did, because at the end of the day, he. he ended up where, where they, they were on important things. Yes? Just a simple question. But, sure. um, so you talk about his views about education. His views on education, you know, he didn't talk about it a lot. Um, he, he was embarrassed by his own um, lack of education. And um, in one of these, when he was in Congress, they had a little... Uh, bio um, on yourself that you'd fill out in various lines, and there's a line for education, they just wrote defective. Um, but, but he, which probably can apply to a lot of people, uh, <laughs> a lot of people today. Um, but he, he obviously is very concerned with picking it up himself, and all the stories, he, it, it's not true that he read by firelight, because he would have gone blind. Um, you know, the stories are that he actually got up in the morning, early in the morning, and read. But the, the sense that he did everything possible to pick up an education himself is true. And Lincoln, in an exaggerated form, really represented the trajectory of American education for a very long time, which is his father can, can't read, basically. He he's, has a year or two of formal schooling, but um, gets, gets by with what he can. And then his son goes to Harvard. And, um, for the longest time in America, I forget the average, maybe it was you know, one, two, three years of extra education each generation. And we kind of stalled out on that. And one theory for why we're seeing an increase in inequality is that in prior um, eras of vast technological change, you've had um, educational change keeping up. And now we've had the technological change, but the, the education um, hasn't kept up. Yeah, it's an excellent question, because conservatives have conflicted views of Lincoln, and I would say 50 years ago, they, um, I would think conservatives were more sympathetic to the Southern agrarian critique of, of Lincoln and the idea that Lincoln was somehow the father of big government or was a tyrant and how he conducted the war, and that, that is still a view you'll find on the right, mostly among libertarians, which I think is perverse because they, they kind of skip over the, the point that owning people is not a libertarian uh, principle, and that was what Lincoln was, was warring against. But now I, th I think um, the conservatives are, are much more um, favorably disposed to Lincoln, but have a lot of ground to make up. I mean, President Obama has done all he can to associate himself uh, with Lincoln. I'm kind of shocked that he didn't go to, to Gettysburg to commemorate the anniversary there, which just seems a, a huge missed opportunity, just something as a fan of Lincoln. You know, if I were president, it'd be the only reason I'd want to be president, you know, so I could go and mark that, that uh, anniversary. But I, my wife and I live in Manhattan in a doorman building, and um, when I gave my book to one of our uh, doormen, who's real, he's an um, Irish immigrant, really hardworking guy, we can 
a tell from his occasional bitter sentiments that he's basically one of us. And I gave him the book, and he said, uh, oh, you wrote a, a book about Lincoln? I thought you were a Republican, you know, which uh, sh shows how um, uh, conservatives and Republicans have, have work to do in this area. And I think it's very important, because anyone like that guy, he recently had a kid, he's really hardworking, he's going to instantly, even if he doesn't know that much about Lincoln, instantly feel kind of an, an emotional and psychological connection uh, to him. So he who owns Lincoln kind of owns the American dream. Yes, sir. Well, you touched on something that I was thinking about. I didn't find it ironic that Lincoln was the first Republican president, and that law cost me that very day did a questionnaire of policies for how he was going to what for the party was uh, was the name of that. It was none of the guy Rush. They were all being Democrats. So it seems to me that the party that that was the party of Lincoln, that was the party of the Thirteenth Amendment, the party of the Fourteenth Amendment, the party of really a Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Rights and the fact that the Kennedy administration did nothing. Um, we have a, a marketing problem uh, in the Republican Party. It's so much of the good thing that we've done are lost in the general population. So how do we, how do we solve that? Well, um, by trying to correct as much error as we can. <laughs> um, and, you know, by uh, being Lincoln esque. And for me, that means that everything the party stands for should be f filtered through aspiration and helping people to make the most of themselves and get ahead. And you know, I probably, you know, I agree with Paul Ryan on probably you know 90% of 95% of um, things, and you know, Rand Paul maybe you know 80% of things. But I th I think those guys are they're way overly obsessed with the debt. And I don't think the way to reach people is through a green eyed shade appeal to cutting government for its own sake. I'd be happy to do it. And it gets us about 35% of the country, that message. If you're gonna reach the, the band in the middle that you need to get, it needs to be about something much deeper. And I think, again, this is what Lincoln represents and what this country at bottom is about, that all men are created equal and um, uh, to pursue happiness, which and it, it's, um, it doesn't mean just going around being happy. It means making the most of your capabilities. That's what the party should, um, should stand for, and there should be no mistaking it. Yes? I think you make a good point. And, um... Well, thank God. It's been 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The working class is a major obstacle to upward mobility. It's not really a political issue. You go on the talk about the disintegration of families. You know, 50 years ago, 5% of kids were born out of marriage, and now it's about 50%. Um, and to a large degree, it's, I, I feel at least it's, it's caused by government policy. Um, it's the whole tax and transfer system. It's, it's, it's based on households and it's based on individual needs. If that is the case, if it is the case that it's an obstacle to upward mobility or a major obstacle to upward mobility, and if it is at least in part or in large part caused by public policy, how can we make it a political issue and how can we make it a winning political issue? Because then, at the end of the day, it's going to sound, if we, the, the way we go about marketing ourselves now, it's going to inevitably sound like we're blaming the yeah. mom or the Yeah, that's an excellent question. Did, did everyone hear that? Um, the question is if, um, how do we address the breakdown of the family um, if it's properly conceived as a political issue because government programs are promoting it? But how, how do we address it without seeming judgmental and as though we dislike um, everyone who, who is in these circumstances? And that's just a really, it's a really tough question, and I don't have an, an answer to it. I think the welfare programs you can address at the margins by saying, you know, if they're if they're too big and too generous and the eligibility is too loose, you're you're attacking the the work work ethic. But there needs to be a broader cultural re renewal around marriage. And you, know, you mentioned that five percent figure. I think the if you divide the um, the population of the country by thirds on um, education level, the top third with college degree or more, their illegitimacy rate is maybe like eight percent. I mean, it's literally at 1950s levels. And this drives me crazy about 
you know, all these rich liberals in the Upper West Side who are so non-judgmental, they all live like Harriet and, and uh, Oz, is it, how is Harriet? Ozzie's, Ozzie and, sorry, Ozzie and Harriet kind of lives. You know, different, w women work more and um, th their changes, but those basic virtues they get and they abide by them. Whereas the, mi the middle that has a high school degree and maybe some college, but not a college degree, you know, in 1982, the illegitimacy rate was something like 14%. That's Ronald Reagan's America. Now it's like 44%. It's much closer to the lower end than it is to the upper. And that's, that's a big um, cultural decline. I think it's important for politicians just to talk about it, even though it's, it's difficult um, to talk about it, because what politicians say does affect the broader um, cultural context. But again, as we were discussing earlier, ultimately it's got to come from churches and from civic groups, and I think this is something where it's never, the, a cultural change will never happen unless liberals are on board on a certain level. Because we can say it and people think we're just being judgmental and nasty, but if Barack Obama says it, you know, that's something different. And to his credit, he has occasionally uh, said it and gives some uh, good speeches, but you know, it's one or two. Um, and it hasn't been a drumbeat. And you know, if, if liberals honestly want people to get ahead, instead of being dependent on government, they'll realize there's no substitute for these, these cultural predicates. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, well, no, there are no good ideas on how to fix the rest Yeah. Well, with Romney, I think it was, he, he always, it, it helps a lot um, to have someone who has risen from nothing. Um, you know, Lincoln, because the Whig economics of that time were vulnerable to all the same criticisms we hear about Republican economics now. But, but he, he could push back. There was one debate when he was uh, being very early on in his political career, already being accused of being an aristocrat. He said, well, look, I was hired for $5 a month to, to float down a, a raft down the Mississippi River. I had one suit of clothes. It would get wet and get dry and get wet and get dry, so it shrank. And I still have the blue mark around my cab. That was a high mark. So if you call that uh, aristocracy, you know, I'm guilty of the charge. It's important to have that kind of story. And Mitt Romney just didn't. And I think at a certain level, he felt guilty about being rich. Not that he'd done anything wrong, but if you look at his, there's this wonderful uh, YouTube moment with his father. Do you know this? When he, he was accosted on a sidewalk when he was running for president by someone who said, you're just a rich guy for the rich. And Romney just breathed fire back at this guy. What are you talking about? I came from nothing, you know, in Mexico. And Mitt was never able to um, tap those kind of emotional reserves, because the, he built his own business, but at the end of the day, he would have been fine, right, even, even if he didn't build his own business. So someone who has a story, you know, personal story of, you know, rising up from the working class or, or the middle class is, is really important. Obama didn't? No, he didn't. But he, he had a, a, a different narrative. Right, is that he's the he's the skinny kid with the the weird name, you know, <laughs> and the mixed race uh, parents, and you know, representing uh, on that basis kind of a, a new a new America or a new step in American tolerance. So, um, presidential campaigns always need a theme and a narrative, and he had one that's particularly important uh, or particularly resonant in 08. But actually, at the end of the day, they could have run anyone in 08; they would have beaten the Republicans. Um, but Romney didn't, you know, he tried to do the kind of the fixer um, turnaround artist thing. But the problem is that reminds people of what he did, you know, and, and what he did was important for the economy, but it did involve, you know, firing 50-year-old guys in Ohio, and those guys aren't, aren't going to vote for you. And they really did a, you know, a tremendous uh, job murdering him in Ohio on the auto bailout and, and other things. So I, private equity is important to this country, but Republicans can't be the party of private equity and can't run candidates out of 
private equity. I'm not a political consultant, but that's just my, that's my take. Any other questions? Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Thank you. And buy books. <laughs>